What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Water Ski Podcast for episode 34 with the good folks of the Water Ski Broadcasting Company. So, Tony Lightfoot, John Waldron, and Vince Talobauer. This was a fun one. Great episode, which is brought to you by the Flowpoint Method. The Flowpoint Method is a brand new online water ski training program developed by Jenny Labaugh and Marcus Brown, one of the guests of the show. And performance in any sport really depends on a lot of factors, right? So uh, mindset, nutrition, technique, equipment, strategy, and the holistic approach that Jenny and Marcus adopted in creating the Flowpoint Method is for people who are truly committed to take their skin to the next level by covering technique, fitness, nutrition, mindset. This is truly a first when it comes to a holistic approach to life on the water. Personally, I love it. I had a chance to look at it, I'm in it, and I believe they have the right approach. And that's why I'm collaborating with them on the mindset section of the Flowpoint Method. With daily, weekly updates, and an extremely extensive library of videos, instructionals, and writings, you can finally remove all the guesswork and get the most out of your time on the water. You can become a member of the Flowpoint Method by going to thewaterskipodcast.com slash method or click on the link in the show notes. But again, thewaterskipodcast.com slash method. Now, I'm really stoked to share this episode with you guys. We had a few technical difficulties. Um, you know, Tony was in Baton Rouge. I was self-isolated in Tallahassee. Vincent and John were in Orlando. But we did try our best to... Uh, to edit this in such a way that is, you know, for you guys to enjoy. A lot of great content. Tony starts by speaking about how the webcasting idea came about, his first few experiences announcing, and then Vince and John really provide a good understanding of the amount of work that goes behind creating a podcast, sorry, behind creating a webcast, um, such as the one they've been providing. I... I truly believe they do a great work and a great service to the sport. And I'm finally happy and excited that I get to share this episode with the rest of the water ski community. So sit back, enjoy, be patient with the volumes, and see you next week. Okay, guys, welcome to the Water Ski Podcast. This is my first episode with three people on top of me, so four. So I don't know how this is going to go. We'll see. But... Uh, Thank you for coming in. I'm connected with Anthony Lightfoot, with uh, Vincent Stalabauer and John Walden. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having us. So, Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, so I guess I would like to start with you, Tony. Um, give me a brief sense of your early ski days and then what brought you to eventually found the Water Ski Broadcasting Company. Well, where do I begin? Well, obviously at the very beginning, I mean, I, I learned I learned how to ski uh, in a rather a rather unusual place, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, around about 1980. You know, my, my dad taught me how to ski out there. You know, and uh, you know, I got pretty good at it uh, pretty quick. Started winning competitions and stuff like that, and uh, and from there, you know, I I was always looking for that uh, for that next challenge. So. Uh, Went back to the United Kingdom, uh, uh, competed uh, in those competitions in the uh, in the junior category, made me way on the, onto the British team, so on and so forth. And it kind of and it kind of snowballed a little a little bit from there, you know. And uh, and at the same time that I was actually learning how to ski and I was actually competing, uh, I was actually rather attracted to the whole notion of actually announcing for the event as well, even though I was I was probably pretty young at the time. I grabbed the microphone, just started uh, riffing uh, to uh, to the to the to the skiers that were on the water at the time, you know, and uh, uh, got pretty good at it. And uh, it's 
and and hopefully I'm still relatively good at it. I'm not too sure. You know? Well, I think you're one of the best, if not the best, uh, behind the mic, buddy. But uh, give me a sense. How old were you when you grabbed onto the mic and started riffing behind skiers? Twelve. Twelve. Yes. So here we already see a connection because uh, in the previous episode I interviewed Vincent and some of Vincent's early passions started around the same age, 12, 13, 14, so begging Clint to drive the boat or holding a camera that was bigger than him. I remember those days, you know, so that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, and that brought you eventually to Louisiana, didn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, rather late in life, I decided that uh, uh, that I wanted to wanted to see how far the uh, my competitive uh, 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 talents would take me uh, within the sport, you know. So, uh, so I was looking uh, for uh, uh, for uh, collegiate water skiing, you know, see 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 what that could offer me, you know. So I got in touch with a few people. Uh, you know, first, first, first of all, I wanted to get a little bit of the lay of the land. So I, I got in contact with, uh, with Phil Chase, who, who was the, uh, the president of the, of the National Collegiate Water Ski Association, kind of give me a lie of the land type deal. Yeah. And he kind of put me in touch, uh, with, uh, with the good folks at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, you know, it's on, you know, because, this was around about 1997. I just uh, just completed uh, doing announcing for for the pro water ski tour in the United States, and I wanted I wanted something to wear uh, where it would keep me in the United States, you know, to where I'd be productive. And uh, collegiate water skiing uh, was that answer. I got in touch with uh, Jim Davidson, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the the person who uh, who coordinated uh, the. The, the raging cajun water ski team and and it, and it kind of uh, kind of took off from there cool cool and you studied communications in in a ul didn't you oh yes yeah i mean was i was i ever going to uh, major in anything other than mass com <laughs> oh, no i guess not i guess not but it's cool because you know like you obviously people might not realize that what you've been doing for so long and so eloquently is also being backed up by some solid studies well, yeah, indeed. I'm, I'm not too sure about being eloquent, but uh, but I, su I suppose you develop that a little bit after uh, after after doing water ski announcing both on site but also on TV as well. I mean, I mean, uh, even even before I went on to college, I had uh, uh, announced and commentated for the sport of tournament water skiing on Sky Sports, on Eurosport, on ITV. And, you know, so I had that experience to, uh, to kind of back me up a little bit. And I think I've probably shocked a few people when it, whenever I started announcing tournaments in the United States, in the United States, you know, they looked around and said, who the heck is this guy? He's decent. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I mean, you certainly had like strong experiences before you came here, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now, you did and, you know, you're a, a skier. We have yeah. Vincent here who is a skier. And then we have John, who really isn't. Although I don't know if Vincent by now, John managed to put you on skis. But uh, why don't you tell us a little bit of, of your story? I know we're skipping to the most recent, but uh, how did you get involved into this? Well, to be honest with you, pretty much my entire involvement comes from Vince, which is, you know, no surprise. But I've actually been on combo skis a couple times in my life. There you go. Vince, so. So I did something, but, uh, yeah, so I basically met Vince in college and I'd say within a month of meeting him, I was behind skis at the <laughs> ski school. And probably a month after that, I was on one ski and some years went by actually where I moved around and I kind of did my own thing in the film industry. That's, that's kind of my thing. And anyway, I came back, got a little more involved in skiing with the, with the webcast and all that. And uh, now my current PB is two and a half at fifty-two k. So, oh my god, dude! You're so, you're so not nothing. No, that's good. That's good. That means you probably start at forty-six. You run that. You run at forty-nine, and then you get into fifty-two. I mean, that's that's water skiing right there for you. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I do. And about a month ago, I could barely run 43k with a lot of help from the driver so i actually got in a lot better in a month but but yeah so so that's pretty much uh that's pretty much my whole water skiing career 
And just to say on top of that as well, I mean, like John really rocked the cable over to Borg on Bress uh, uh, last season as well. He, he definitely impressed me with it, with his silky smooth uh, uh, turns around the corners. So just... Honestly, Tony impressed me. I, I couldn't figure out the turns at all behind the cable park, and I had one like bad crash. I skipped like three times, and I look up, and I see Tony just calmly going around the corner looking like a figure skater, and I think what he said... <laughs> I think he was like, he's like, you have to go with the turn, darling, or something like that, and just smoothly went around. And I was like, I was blown away. I've never seen him on skis before. And this dude's just cruising around like it's nothing. Tony, uh, well, I can't see that. I mean, it's one of those things like a bike, right? If I think you the word he, he used was majestic. Who, who yeah. used that? John? John, yeah. Well, it seems like an appropriate answer after you said you have to turn smoothly, darling, or something along those lines. <laughs> Um, all right. So, John, I have to ask, because I haven't seen you ski. Are you right foot forward or left foot forward? I am right foot forward. Right foot forward. Okay, so we can continue this conversation. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, okay. I'm left. Does that exclude me? Yeah, you, you, can, you can get offline right now. <laughs> so, no, listen. Um, I guess, so you guys have been, the three of you as a unit, collaborating for how long? Three years now? Yeah, yeah with a fair assessment, yeah. Yeah, I think um, this summer would be the the third summer of doing webcast, really solid, the three of us every single time, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. And listen, I want to hear the story from, uh, uh, from Tony first, okay? Because you and Vince have been collaborating for a few extra years than, than three. I want to hear how this collaboration started because one of the things people don't understand is that you guys work efficiently as hell together, but you couldn't find any two more different people in the world. And obviously, I'll have John chime in on that because he has a good observation spot. But Tony, tell me how this collaboration with Vince started. Oh, it basically uh, basically started at one event, and that's the Swiss Pro Slalom. You know, I mean, I was I was brought on board uh, by uh, by Vince's uh, father, uh, Clint Stadelbau, to uh, to announce uh, the uh, the event. You know, and it kind of and it and it and it kind of had its genesis there a little bit. You know, I got more involved with the, with the event. Uh, uh, Clint obviously knew that I, that I had a passion for broadcasts and that kind of stuff. And also with webcasting a little bit on the side, because by the time I got involved with Swiss Pro Slalom, uh, uh, TWBC had been in existence for about maybe about five, five or six years. And and, and even and even though we and even though I and uh, and TWBC were doing webcast, I mean, it was it was, you know, it was. It was a really, really, very, very much a solo effort at that point. And then once, once I got involved with Swiss Pro Slalom, and Vince, uh, Vince uh, saw what was, uh, uh, what could potent, what could potentially grow from there. You know, we, we decided to partner up and uh, take it to where you see it now. Sweet, guys. Sorry, quick break. Uh, Tony, your microphone a touch more distance if you can't. Can you just distance it? Yeah, that should work. Yeah. Uh, give me a test one two. One two. Maybe one. a little bit too far. A little okay. closer. Check. Check. Okay, that's Check. better. Yeah, that's more manageable. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so I'm I'm gonna start from here. All right, so yeah, eventually collaboration together. Uh, what is the first tournament that you guys went in as a unit? You know, because at Swiss you showed up and then you guys sort of collaborated by the virtue that you were a Swiss. But what was the first tournament that you prepared together? Wow, that's a hard question, you know, because uh, naturally I'll gravitate towards Swiss Pro Slalom because we do much, much of our, uh, we do quite a bit of preparation for that tournament. I mean, I mean, let's, I mean, let's, let's be, let's be honest with that. You know, I mean, we, we spend, not not just days or weeks, but months. You know, preparing preparing for for that event itself, and we and we dedicate uh, pretty pretty much the same amount of time to each of the webcasts that we do uh, beyond the scope of uh, the Swiss Swiss Pro Slalom event. You know, okay. so yeah. Uh, so yeah. 
Yeah, so the, the, I'm assuming the, the ensuing Swiss after that. But I see Vincent uh, raising his hand. What's up, buddy? Yeah. No, I mean, for, for me, it was pretty clear um, <clears throat> which event we went in. At least Tony and I as a unit, and then, and then John tackled along. So um, as, uh, as Tony said, we always put a lot of effort into Swiss Pro, but I always, uh, always didn't really take all the credit for Swiss Pro because Swiss Pro were at home, you know, it's, it's a bit easier to put a webcast at home than, than anywhere else. But the first time, the first time that, um, that we may say we went as a unit, packed our bags and went somewhere was at San Gervasio. Uh, which year, I don't know, but you are the man that gave us the first opportunity to show what we had outside Swiss. It's the first, the first check I received, me personally, to go and do a webcast was, uh, was San Gervasio. And uh, you might remember the year. I want to say it was like 2017, I want to say, but I can't exactly recall. 2016 or 2017. John, you came twice or three times in San Gervasio? I've been uh, twice. Okay, so I'm pretty sure it was 2017. Because 20... Mm. Huh. Oh, it must. It was 2017 because we graduated from college in 2016, and I would have not been able to come to your event while I was at college. So I believe it was 2017. I and if think. my memory doesn't fail me, I think Tony, you came in 2016 on your own, and then started. Tw no, yeah, for sure at the Junior Worlds in 2010. Uh, I know we didn't we didn't touch on it, but in terms of like the San Gervasio Pro M, you came the year before by yourself, uh, and then we with Vince the year after, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Tony, we can't hear you. Can't hear me? No. Check, check, check one, two. Yeah, you gotta bring the volumes up, Tony. Check, check. There check you one, go. Two. There you go. Yeah, that's good. Good now, okay. Okay. Okay, perfect. So yeah, you came the year before by yourself and then in 2017, Vincent joined you, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that definitely sounds consistent. Yeah. Well, guys, I honestly wasn't aware that uh, we were the first one, the first ones giving you like, you know, a shot aside of Swiss. Um, and then the following year, John tagged the lawn. Um, I would like to start by maybe give a sense, all three of you, uh, at whichever order, give a sense of how hard it is to put together a webcast. Because I think people don't, might not be aware of this you know they get on youtube they watch you know they load it up on their phone while they're driving or while they're you know at home and they see a well done webcast but i don't think they they understand the the commitment behind it so who wants to start i mean the i mean i think we all come from backgrounds uh john with with making movies me with making the few videos here and tony already making webcasts i think we didn't jump in thinking it was easy, but I think no one really thought it was going to be that hard, at least on my end. Um, the problem I find the most with webcast is that there is absolutely zero logic. <laughs> Things fail 24 seven. It's not because it worked yesterday that it's going to work today. It's not because it works today that it's going to work tomorrow. Stuff breaks, stuff goes wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's always, it's always solving the problem and we are very, very, uh, uh, gear oriented. If the gear doesn't work, that's it. While where you make a movie, I mean, John's going to confirm the gear is, is, is 10% of it. And then it's actually creativity and, and all that. While a webcast, the, the cable doesn't work. You don't get the camera period until that cable works. You're not going to get it. So I, I, on my end, the, the, the difficulties is, is, is getting consistent gear and, 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 and keeping all this up and running. That's where 90% of the, of the work comes in, is, is making sure everything stays alive, basically. So that's your side. Um, I want to hear your side, John. What do you think? Is it right in saying that equipment is way more crucial in webcasting than in, than in movie production? I would say that's a hundred percent right because I mean, of course, a lot of equipment goes into filmmaking, 
but you'll spend two hours setting up a shot, lighting it, working with actors, and really just press record on the camera. But with webcasts, I mean, the difference between pressing record and editing the footage later versus actually seeing the footage live is a massive, massive difference. Like, the kind of hardware you need to even have eight HD videos running live simultaneously between when you can cut them is, like, literally 20 times the power you need to even edit an HD video. I mean, the kind of computer, the kind of computing power you need to simultaneously run that stuff is just nuts. Yeah. It, it really, yeah, 90% of it comes down to the equipment. And, I mean, there's definitely a creative factor for sure, but equipment is definitely king when it comes to live. Yeah, and honestly, one of the big reasons why I wanted, I wanted you, John, on this is that I want to tease out that 10% uh, later on. So the, if we go, let's just say, with this random equation of 10% equipment, 90% creativity in movies, and we flip that into webcasting, I'd be really curious to tease out that 10% of creativity within um, water ski webcasting. Uh, but we'll get to it later. Um, what... Tony, what is the challenges that you see? Or, I mean, give a sense to the audience of how complicated it is to run a website from your side. Uh, yeah, so far, so far as a webcast is, uh, is concerned, I mean, and, and I mean, Vince and John touched upon it, but there's, a, there's an awful lot of grunt work that needs to go into making the webcast go from, uh, from, start, from start to finish. Uh, it's setting up the cameras, setting up, setting up the cables, uh, you know, because I mean, with a lot, with a lot of sites, I mean, they're incredibly spaced out. I mean, it's not like a soccer stadium or anywhere like that, where whereas like the walking distances, you know, and running distances between point A and point B is relatively short. I mean, you've got the whole entire length of the lake, you know, to 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 get something that would be seemingly minor corrected and then then going back to the computer and then then seeing how how much or how how much or how little will actually affected the end product you know and on top of all of that you've got to make sure that that your that your streaming server and your internet connection are all are all fine and good as well because i mean we could put all this work together you know? We could put all of this work uh, to, together to to make the uh, the webcast uh, go right, but if we don't have sufficient uh, sufficient strength so far as our internet connection is concerned, or if the or if the servers are playing up, then it could it it could all well be for nothing, you know. And right. uh, you know we've uh, you know we've 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 tried our uh, our ultimate best to make sure that we got all of the pieces together and they all fit right in the jigsaw puzzle that is a webcast for e for for each, for each of these events. Yeah, no, I, it's it's crazy to me how like we've already mentioned a lot of variables that could go wrong. Like so, first of all, insane amount of cameras, um, and making sure that they are streamed you know, able to be streamed online, so computational power. You have internet connection, and let's face it, water ski sites that tend to host pro events are not in the middle of a city with fiber cables around. There, there might be a 4G if we're lucky, right? So um, a lot of complications, for sure. Um, so as, 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 sorry, as Tony mentioned, yeah, at, at the end, it comes down to why why is it hard because there's so much stuff no matter how ready you are and 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 how prepared you are there's so much stuff that can go wrong that's that's a bit that there is a lot of the internet the power the computer the cable there is all this that at the end holds on that one cable on that one thing and you got a hundred of these so you can you prepare and that's what we do and you get spare gear and all that but at the end uh, internet's down internet's down electricity is down electricity is down and and i think hopefully by now we 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 saw most of the problem that can happen during a webcast and, and we somewhat solved them but um let's say i'm not excited to see the next weird thing that's going to come up on our webcast yeah and that's what <laughs> i was going to say right like you you are 
learning as you go, but every year you implement something new. So the, the possibility of making mistakes still remains roughly the same, right? Um, much bigger, much bigger every uh, time. To be honest with you, even the things we've been using for years go wrong in ways that I couldn't have predicted in my wildest <laughs> dreams. Like, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if we want to get into it, but I think you actually remember this when we learned how much a, uh, uh, a radio signal can interfere a BNC cable to the point where it can completely freeze a camera at San Gervasio. Yeah. Absolutely blew my mind. I didn't realize it could be such a sensitive antenna for something like that. And, you know, we went days with the camera freezing before we found out it was the walkie-talkie. Right, right. Yeah, no, there's there's all sorts of variables that you, can, you can't possibly predict. And we're talking about an expert here, someone that knows about cameras, you know? So the fact that even, John, you couldn't, like, conceive that goes to show how complicated and, and multifaceted the, the webcast uh, productions are. Um, Tony, I know you had some technical issues. Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Ah, fantastic. Um, okay, so, Vino. And yeah. And I mean, a lot, and, and I mean, we're, we, we continue to experiment with, with a whole bunch of, uh, of other aspects, you know, to go into the webcast, you know. I mean, I have enduring images of, like, of Vincent uh, going out into the water with our uh, with our submerged camera to try and test uh, to to test how far that that camera can be away from the buoy and yet still get a good a good panning shot as the skier goes by in e in each direction. You know, we started with that camera right up close to the buoy and that we found out that the camera couldn't pan quick enough or smooth enough to catch the skier. So we had so we had to go all from, all mathematic on it and bring the camera away from the buoy so it could actually track the skier more effectively. Yeah, no, it's uh, the amount of work that you guys put behind this, and I know all three of you very well, is even beyond me. You know, like sometimes I, I speak with Vincent because we're good friends and he gives me some update on the latest, craziest thing that he's planning on doing. But yet I just, I just can't express enough uh, well, first of all, how much work you guys have behind it, and secondly, how appreciative the water skiing community is that you're putting that work up. Um, you, know what you know what scares me a little bit? You know, the mad skills that Vino and John have as drone pilots as well, you know, because, I mean, <laughs> ex ex exactly. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're absolutely insane with what those drones can do, you know, and, and Vincent especially, you know, like trying to pilot that thing like about two, two, three feet above the water and still track the skier from behind. You know, I thought, man alive, this is going to be this is going to be expensive if, if, if those things hit the water. And they have, right, Vino? By the way, we're getting into FPV drones, too. <laughs> we're just now getting into it. So it, it, it should be pretty cool here pretty soon. It's exciting so far, but it's insane what these little drones can do. So this what are these? Race. Oh, they're, they're uh, racing style drones. They're like imagine like a rocket like there's no gps anything built in you press the throttle and it goes and it can do like 120 kilometers and wow yeah we we're getting some cool shots here pretty soon with those that's pretty cool that's pretty cool vino tell us uh, i mean so one of the great things about this combination of people is i want the stories i want the stories of when things went well and i want the stories when things went wrong and Vino, why don't we start with uh, the, <laughs> the Swiss Pro bag of ice story? <laughs> the Swiss Pro bag of ice story. That was that was the year of John or the year before John. I think it's the year before John. I don't know this one. It's the year before John. So there's only stories when shit goes bad because when it goes when it goes when it goes well, it's like well, well we. We somewhat managed to do this thing, so Tony is gonna Tony is gonna remember that. Actually, that is the that is the I would say me personally the 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 webcast that we actually walked out of it frustrated. Normally we prepare for webcast, we do it whether it runs well or not so well. Once we're done, usually we're somewhat happy with our product because we're like, ah, oh, we're happy we pulled it off. But that Swiss Pro was the second Swiss Pro that Tony and I did together. So the first Swiss Pro, Tony came as an announcer. Then we did the first webcast the year after. And that was the, the second webcast. And we actually uh, 
saw the potential we could do, and I added way too much once again with computing power that wasn't following up, with gear that wasn't following up. And we ended up throughout the event walking from the house to the lake. We had a Thomas Cavacas, which is a, a, a friend of mine that, that lives at Swiss. His job was to walk ice from my house to the lake to cool off Tony's computer and the video transmitter that were literally melting. Tony's computer was literally melting. He was getting shocked, touch, touching it. It was overheating. So we're live on those webcasts with bags of ice everywhere. And at the end of the webcast, even Tony says, next year, we just need to take care of our comfort. It's too rough. And I've always, <laughs> since then, it's always been like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of our comfort. And, and we've just been adding. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it's the process like you become comfortable with this thing and then you add the extra like uh, you add drones or you add the, the water camera you keep adding eventually you're never going to be comfortable oh, that's the whole the whole goal is get, just to add more we still get shocked on occasions you know <laughs> Mostly in Italy. I don't know why. <laughs> well, that's because you guys keep using American outlets. Convert to European and you'll be fine. Well, what's funny is every year a different one of us has gotten seriously shocked. <laughs> and San Gervasio, next year it's Tony's turn. <laughs> <laughs> next year Tony gets shocked for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. And that, and that begs a good question, right? Because, like, jokingly, who would you rather get shot shocked and the webcast still works you know because uh, you know like tony if there's no announcing there's no webcast but if there's no video there's no webcast right if there's uh, we're, no year working there's no webcast we're we're a tight crew no one no one can get shocked believe me exactly. that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying yeah. so we just need a, we just we just all need to wear crocs you know with the rubberized sole <laughs> exactly when we take our shoes off <laughs> so Okay, so guys, yeah, I gave you, the, like, we gave you the first opportunity to do a webcast production, but since then, you've been doing quite a few, uh, and particularly in the last, in the last couple of years. Uh, Tony, what are some of the highlights? Give us some of the tournaments that you guys webcasted and maybe some good stories. Oh, wow. Uh, I, mean, la I mean, last year, what it, which tournaments did we do last year? We'd done the Swiss Pro, San Gervasio, uh, uh Lacano, that was, I mean, that, that was, that was, that was a pretty good tournament. Norway. You know, Norway as well with the, uh, the world adaptive award ski championships, you know, that, that was, that, that was, that was just amazing to see, uh, the level of competition with, bet, bet, between those guys up there in Norway, you know, I mean, it'd been a while since I actually watched adaptive water skiing, but the things that these guys can do and on, on the water is just absolutely staggering. You know, and, we, and I mean, I was personally blown away way by it, you know, and uh, I think we come away having done a, a very, very good webcast on on that particular event. And uh, hopefully we can get to do more, uh, especially with the adaptive skin, you know, because I mean, if it's if, if there's one group of skiers that certainly deserves the exposure, these guys certainly do. I would agree. No Norway actually has got somewhat of a good story also webcast wise. It's the first webcast that I wasn't there for the setup. I was traveling from, uh, so that was, a, John flew from Geneva to Norway prior to the webcast, about a week prior to the webcast to, um, to visit the countries and get, and get uh, pictures. Tony traveled with all the gear on his own, like a big boy. With all the gear to Norway, and I was traveling from Barcelona to Norway. I was uh, I skied the Open European in uh, in Cesenia, and then we went to holidays in Barcelona for two days with Alicia. And I was traveling from Barcelona to Norway. What was the score at Europeans? One and a half at twelve. Uh, at eleven, sorry. One ah, and a half okay. at eleven. Ah, fair, fair. Pretty good one. Got to two blew out. <laughs> okay. Parentheses <laughs> aside. Yeah. And I got stuck. I got canceled flight. I was stuck in Barcelona. Uh, I ended up spending the night in Barcelona. Then I had a Charles de Gaulle flight and then finally got there. And I remember uh, 
boarding the plane and talking to John, telling him, yeah, that camera is going to go there, that cable, this, that. And I was picturing John and Tony that had to set up the site in, uh, in, uh, in Norway. And, and luckily for me, John was there getting stuff together because I know Tony was busy talking server and internet with the guys over there in Norway. So John and Tony got, got this site together, which, which actually was a bit of a stress to, to not be, be there to set it up. But well, I mean, ju judging by John's face on the webcam right now, it was also a stress for him to set it up. It was a, I mean, it's always a weird setup, but there were definitely a few very weird things there. Like something happened with the power. I don't know if there was a surge or what, but it fried something. I can't remember if it was a battery charger or we had something totally fry and then everything was dead, including the computers and they wouldn't turn on. And it was like an hour of trying to figure out what happened and if every piece of equipment got fried. And in the end, I still have no idea what happened because <laughs> everything is completely fine other than this one piece of equipment that got fried and I can't remember I feel like it was a battery charger but I mean yeah there's always problems but there were definitely some some weird ones there okay well listen I I'm curious to hear from you John like so you jump in into this uh, you know you knew Vino already but you jump into this relationship of Vincent Stadabauer Tony Lightfoot which I'll be honest with you after the first year I got them there I mean, they all, you guys obviously deliver a great product, but to me, the relationship between Vino and Tony is enough entertainment value to justify having them there. Uh, as, a, as an observer, what, how did they manage to work together? Because obviously, by the time you stepped in, they already had a webcast running and functional. You obviously brought in expertise and you brought the level up, but they already had a thing going. What was your... like? Where was your mind when you saw the, them two working together? Well, I don't know if, if they would necessarily agree with this, but I think they're two opposite extremes, and I think I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. So that, that tends to work out. But, I mean, it, in general, you hit the nail on the head. It's very, very entertaining, and it's like... It, it, it's like sometimes Tony will just sit there, and, I mean, the dude is a wizard, like, on Excel and with vMix, and he'll just be doing stuff that I don't even understand on VMix. Just, and, and I mean, it, it's kind of amazing what he can do sometimes. But then, you know, like four hours will go by. And it's like, Tony, what are you doing? And the next thing you know, Vince and Tony are just yelling at each other back and forth. And you're like, oh, my goodness. And you just have to walk away from it because it gets, it gets nasty quick. And then 20 minutes later, it's like nothing happened. And Vince is running around setting up cameras and Tony's back on VMix doing things I don't even understand. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go and, and do my thing because it's still like, I mean, I'm always shooting promo videos and stuff too, which is kind of a, a full-time thing in itself. So I'll either go shoot a bit of a promo video. Or it's I'll a good escape for him. It's a good escape for <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, get the honestly, drone flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but honestly, I'm like, oh, hopefully those batteries are charged by now. No, it's super entertaining. It, it's just super extreme. Either it's like we're super angry at each other or we're all best friends from like every 20 minutes back and forth. Oh, wow. So there, there's about like 36 relationships in a day because that's the other thing. Like if there's one thing that like over the years, I've been trying to study these two, you know, and see how do they manage to work together? Because, I mean, can't find any any more different people. Um, but I think one of the things that that like puts them together and my dad kind of underlined the first day that they came there. Remember, Vincent, like was they're both workhorses like in their own different ways, like these guys can truly work, you know, like they we got, we got one thing in common, Tony and I, the webcast will not go down. That's the one thing we got. <laughs> That's the one thing we got together. I might go down. Tony might go down, but the webcast will not go down. This, <laughs> this Tony, Tony might agree with. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah I definitely subscribe to that. Yeah, and, and you know, what's funny is that, like, my dad, you, you guys will remember the story. The first time the UK, you guys came together as a group, the, the two of you, before John, uh, there was a, you guys generally show up to the site two days before to make sure that everything hopefully kind of works. And by day one, I think my dad showed up to the site to take a practice set at 6, left at 8 p.m., and you guys were still working in the dark. And my dad told me, 
tell them they're going to be back next year, which I was like, Dad, we haven't shot one minute of webcasting. Maybe on Friday nothing works. And he goes, I don't care. I see the way they work and tell them they're going to be back next year. You know, so I found, and you guys obviously know the story because I, I told you several times, but I think it goes to show that no matter what's going to happen, the webcast will not go down, right? Mm -hmm. um, Vino, tell me a time where the webcast went down, if there was one. No, it went down pretty recently. It went down at, uh, we lost internet for about three seconds at the, at the Swiss Pro last year. We lost it. Uh, we lost internet during Sasha's second round. Actually, he had a pretty important pass at 10-2. Uh, internet just went down for I don't know three, four, five seconds, barely. But we just lost internet at some point. Um, otherwise, can you talk about the King of Darkness? Yeah, K King of Darkness was a rough one. Yeah, King of Darkness, the webcast. That's the roughest. It, I can't get any more rough. The I've never got shout so much at a water ski lake in my life. Let's put it this way. The so webcast. The, can you give some context? Of what kind of tournament is that? You know, what is King of Darkness? Yeah, hey, look look at Tony's face. Tony, yeah, yeah, Tony yeah. still got nightmares. We don't worry. We still all have nightmares. <laughs> King of Darkness is a jump event uh, that happens to take place in Winter Garden, Florida. Usually end of the year around November. It's put together by uh, the Garcias, Steve and Dana Garcia. Um, great event, great, great event. One of the best water ski events out there. Uh, really, Steve makes a, makes a great show out of it. And, um, and we happen uh, to be on board at, the, I believe it was the second edition of the King of Darkness. Yes. Yeah, uh, first, first edition, uh, they had a webcast and uh, the, we showed up to do the webcast at the second edition. And it's, it, it was a big event with a lot of stuff going on. We didn't have good gear. Uh, we go back to, to the gear. We, we, we had good gear. At least it wasn't dialed in properly. And, and we had a lot of problem with the computer freezing constantly. We couldn't make a move without this computer to freeze for 30 seconds. And one of the most stressful uh, moments in my life was when we had to play the U.S. National Anthem. And if you ever been to King of Darkness, there is actually quite a lot of spectators for a water ski event. Uh, the whole shores were packed. We had a couple problems when the event began, began and, and there was a couple friction already between us and Steve because obviously stuff should have worked better than it did on that day, but that's how webcast goes. And we're about to play the U.S. National Anthem and everyone's rising and we hit the computer to play and the computer froze. And that was the longest minute of my life with the whole webcast waiting for the national anthem. Everyone standing up. Steve and Garcia. By the way, there's like 3,000 people. It yeah, yeah. Like there's something like 3,000. Yeah, there's a lot of people there. at the lake. And Garcia just staring at us. And I remember, I knew he was behind me, Steve. And I just remember looking at the screen. I'm like, no one clicks, no one looks back. We just pray now. And we waited, waited. And it took maybe. 30 seconds, it wasn't that long, but it felt like it took 20 minutes for this for this uh, national anthem to play. But it played. It played. That was that was that was one of the stressful moments I had, to be honest, in webcast. I mean the the the, the setup was cold, nothing was working, a lot of pressure, a lot of people. And we, we scrapped through it, but but the webcast didn't go down. But I mean, to, we to be honest with through, you, yeah. it doesn't end there, though. Because right after that, and no one could have ever predicted this. This is just one of those things that happens. Mm -hmm. We were all running through um, this one audio board, a pretty advanced audio board, to be honest. And I don't know if it... I honestly don't know what happened. I don't know if it ever worked back. I guess, Tony, you can tell me if you ever figured it out. But anyway, it just completely died. Our entire audio for the vent just completely went out right there and this was like 40 minutes in i think or i can't remember maybe it was just before we went live and we figured it out before the anthem i can't remember the order but anyway it completely went out no audio whatsoever mm. and man that was uh that was for me that was a very stressful 20 minutes because i pretty much just ran around and just brainstormed and just tried everything i could possibly think of and i ended up jury rigging some some crazy like system of ex audio accessories together to create like a line into the microphone input on the motherboard of the computer, like not even a good microphone input, just like the little stock one. And I ran it out of the output of the entire audio setup for the lake. 
so that the microphones went into the mixer for the whole lake and this crazy system into the back of the computer. And to be honest, it did not sound good, but we had sound. So that was at least better than not having sound. Yeah, that, that goes to show like how you guys have to adapt on the spot, you know, really have to adapt on the spot. As of now, Crossfinger, that's the only event they had to hold on the webcast. The last thing I wanna you want to hear on the radio for us is we're holding on the webcast to start the event. That's I mean, that's the last thing you want to hear. And that's the that's the only time, yeah, we had to hold on the webcast. Uh, we didn't have audio. They didn't want to start without an answer, which I totally understand. So we held on the webcast. Or, or, luckily, not long, like 10 minutes, but, but it was a long 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, what about a story where... where things went a little bit uh, astray and how you guys managed to do it be beside the king of darkness well i mean these guys have pretty have pretty good memories about uh, about those mm -hmm. kinds of things but uh, but for me I, I i try to put it at the furthest furthest possible place in my mind and just like keep it there and not put it on in, on in, on instant on instant recall you know because i mean i i'm, I'm in my 50s now you know, I mean, and the and the and these guys, these guys, these guys are relatively young compared to me. So, I'm, so I guess they've got more of their faculties so far as memory retention goes. But uh, uh, if I was to recall, a... you you're going to recall one. You're going to recall one. It was recently in Abu Dhabi on the last day. You're going to remember. You. Oh, the yeah, la I think yeah. I mean that there, there was there was something uh, going on stream last. Key. What was that? But the stream key, key. Right. you remember that it was a pretty oh, stressful yeah, the stream, time. Oh yeah, the yeah, stream key. Go ahead. I mean, I mean that. I mean that. That was one of those situations where, where like thirty seconds feels like three seconds. You know, uh, you know, well, three seconds feels like thirty seconds type deal. You know, so, so, so yeah. I mean, there, there was, there was a situation with, with YouTube. You know, to where. Uh, I mean, without going into any technical things, there's a specific stream key code that you have to have within your streaming system in order to to place it, put it in the right place. We were experimenting with a new kind of uh, a stream key, and we've been actually been reusing that stream key over the last few days, and that's the reason why we had a pretty darn good archive of the events that took place uh, during the during this event that we had in Abu Dhabi. You know, and then it came down to like the final final two events, and and this and and it wasn't streaming. It wasn't streaming. The key wasn't working, and then so I, I had to like think on my feet and come up with a, with a solution. And I mean, YouTube don't tell you this. YouTube doesn't tell you that a stream key is only is only good for a certain amount of of, of instances. But we found out to, uh, right there and then. So we had to create a whole new stream key. And once we got that situation uh, taken care of, then we, were able, then we were able to stream. Another kind of unrelated event with Abu Dhabi, well, it, it uh, dealt with Abu Dhabi TV. You can, you, uh, Vince can probably uh, talk, talk a little bit more about that because there are different television systems throughout the world. And we, and we, 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 knew, we knew that, uh, uh, well, almost too late, didn't we? Vince. Yeah, I mean Abu Dhabi. So we we happened to be at the Wakeboard Worlds in uh, Abu Dhabi last November, which was which was a great opportunity for us to to go and webcast something different than Wariski. And uh, for the last final day, as Tony mentioned, it was a pretty stressful day. It was a five day event. Four days went perfect, no problem, no issue. And we were joking 24/7. Uh, this is boring. We don't have any problem. We're just here flickering between cameras. But we all knew in the back of our head that that we're happy about it. And the main problem when it's a five-day event, day five, you're more di tired than day one. So if the problems are going to come, the earlier they come, the better, because you got strength to solve them. Yep. Day five, we're all, we're all zombies. We're dead. And yeah, it happened that the last day of the event, we couldn't go live. Uh, we were hitting go live. We couldn't go live. We finally solved that issue. That then Abu Dhabi TV that was supposed to set up this whole things with 10 cameras and a crane and this and that, 
they showed up with no gear. Something happened. Uh, they had another sports event. I don't know what happened. They showed up. They had no gear. So we had to send them the live, which obviously is pretty complicated because all our stuff is uh, basically, to keep it simple, on the American standard and all their stuff is on the European standard. So that took a bit of doing on our end. So yeah, the last day of Abu Dhabi was... Uh, was uh, it went smooth for the for the audience? It didn't really go smooth for us. Yeah, but I think that's a constant, right? I mean, if there's one thing that I see as a tournament organizer having you guys there is that the thing is smooth. We get the compliments, you get the compliments from people online, but you don't have time to even look at them by the sheer amount of work that you have to do, right? Um, it's- it's insane how, yeah, everyone's like, oh, it was great. It was awesome. In the back of my head, I'm like, ah, it, was, it wasn't awesome. I, I should, we were trying to somewhat keep our head above the water the whole time. Right. <laughs> and they're right. like, oh, yeah, yeah, really? It looked so good. I'm like, well, good. <laughs> and we developed a really good rapport with the Abu Dhabi Police Department as well because we were also flying drones at that event. And the, the site on the Eastern Mangrove was right underneath the flight path of a local airport so we so we had to be really really careful about how high we flew the drones like really ju- just above the tree line you know and and, and mean the uh, the police department was looking around but i mean they came over to vince and they said okay you know just you know you could still fly but just keep it low keep it low low yeah which obviously vince uh, was all on board with that right like he he's a bit of a uh, reckless uh, drone fly like pilot um okay so and yet you guys managed to make it work and i think part of it is also like to a certain degree although i know that if a cable is broken someone has to fix it to a certain degree you keep your duties fairly separate and potentially i think one of the reasons why tony doesn't remember some of the issues is not only his age as he says but it's the fact that whilst he's there he's also announcing right so, Tony, how about uh, an announcing story that stands out or some, something that you remember with particular pleasure? Ah, oh, announcing story. Uh, well, I mean, there's so, I mean, there so many of them. I mean, I announced my first World Championships way back in 1991, uh, did the 2009 uh, World Championships, 2013 World Championships. I haven't done a World Championship since then, but uh, fingers crossed it will come my way relatively soon. Uh, man, uh, obviously the, uh, the world slalom championships in 2009, you know, was one that stood out for me, you know, Will Asher winning that event and, uh, he, he, he was up against some really strong competition like Thomas de Gasperi, you know, this was, this was at the lakes at cast in stone in Calgary in Canada. And, and I had like the sweetest announcing setup you could possibly imagine actually arrived at the event a few days before and the the guys the guys there uh were were proposing to put an announcing tower right on the island at the very end of the lake and you know and i turned around to one of these guys they said you know what would be good is if we had a tower that's that's just over the lake right in the middle right on the other side where the spectators are Next day, I saw this tower that was <laughs> that was erected just like that, just, just 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 for us, and that kind of just blew me away, you know. And I mean, that was that was a great tournament, uh, the 2009 World Championships. I still have the cowboy hat, you know, from uh, from the the good folks in Calgary. That was a great event. But recent history, last year, Will Asher running uh, running at 10.25 meters at uh, Lacanel, uh, the, the the Malibu Open. I mean that that was that was that was such a great event, uh, such a good call on that one. You know, I mean, I'll remember that for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think the other thing that impresses a lot of people about your announcing is the fact that you know you do not stop. Because let's face it, like I think it's a challenge about water ski events in general, right? Like maybe golf compares in in the terms of sheer length. Like these things are long, you know, like they start at 8 a.m., they finish at 6 p.m. You have to be there two hours before just to work or three hours before and then two hours later just to amount. Like, how do you manage to keep talking for that long? Huh. Uh, I, I wish I could provide you with a succinct answer. But I mean, when it came down to the world championships a few years ago, I, I, I basically attributed it down to Jaeger. 
you know, <laughs> just keep 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 me, keep my voice, uh, uh, you know, lubricated. That 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 type of deal, you know. So, but uh, I. I you know, I just try and just try and have a decent drink, uh, not alcoholic, mind you. Yeah. Uh, just just have, just have that nearby, and uh, and just try and pace myself uh, during the, during the course of the, of, of the day. You know, and uh, you know, in recent years, it's gone a little bit easier. You know, with uh, with with uh, with other announcers uh, coming in to help share the workload. You know, what I mean, like uh, in San Chavasio, you got like Fiamengi. Uh, he's he, he does a good job there. You know, uh, Johnny Papet, you know, he did uh, the uh, uh, Lacanel, you know, Ola Tomter over at uh, the, uh, uh, the the Adaptive Worlds. You know, I mean, those guys have been absolutely, uh, absolutely great, you know. Yeah, no, I can see all that bit of help, you know, like even just to take a break, but even also to feed off each other in, in the announcing part. Uh, Vino, I wanted to ask you a question because I know that not all the events you, you guys broadcast are a bit different, right? So you have institutional events like the Worlds or Europeans, you have pro tournaments as pro only, and then you have pro and amateur tournaments, right? And obviously our tournament is a pro-am. And I remember, well, maybe it was the first or second year, there was some issues in San Gervasio with whatever it was. And I was like, listen, man, it's fine. Today is Friday is only amateurs like we need to be dialed in for tomorrow pros and you remember what you told me yeah i i told you every amateur deserves to be on the webcast yeah that is that is something that that always frustrated me at a point you can't even imagine i uh, i understand why the ski events are long and i understand that usually people want to keep i mean want to watch the the streaming where the pros are on the water but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't leave the stream on when amateurs on the water. I remember where, when I was a kid, or I mean, st still now, that the few webcasts that there was would only be final or would only be series two and one, and I could never see myself skiing. So that's always kind of something uh, I told myself. I'm like, if I make a webcast, the the the, the 14 years old kid's gonna be watching himself. You know what I mean? And yeah. and the parents from that 14 also gonna be able to watch the webcast. And if, if the audience wants to watch it, they can go and, and then and then you leave it on and then more pe more and more people tune in for for the pros. That's always been if we if we can, we'll 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 be there, which adds quite a lot of work on our end. But it's already so hard to put everything together. Might as well put it together for a couple more hours, you know? Yeah. No. And I think it's a very admirable, admirable approach, you know. And also as well, I mean, our webcasts, I mean, are automatically archivable as well, you know. So once the event finishes, you know, they have they have the event to be able to watch, you know. And what kind of struck me, going back to Abu Dhabi again, is when we arrive back at the hotel after, like, doing the 12 hours straight of doing the webcast, you know, we're, 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 we'll, go, we'll go by the lists and the elevators, and there'll be, like, clusters of, like, some of the junior riders watching the archive of the webcast that took place on that day to, 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 to see to see how they did because the competitors that are there they don't they don't go, normally go out of the way to watch the webcast as the event's going on i mean it's live it's out there in front of them type deal but you know you know give the give give those guys a chance to actually watch themselves afterwards and they'll and they'll take it every day and twice on sunday oh for sure for sure and i think obviously to me the value is more of those that are not competing that get to watch. But certainly I've watched a uh, webcast archive of me skiing to see what the hell I did wrong. Or, you know, if I had a good set, I would also like to watch it again. So for sure, for sure. Now, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna be focusing with you, John, on this one. But I'll, I'll just try to give an introduction to my question. Um, there's a side of webcasting or a, let's say video in general in water skiing that is getting it out there right like and me and vincent spoke about it the, the the previous episode in terms of like we need content out there but also we need good content and i think you've been in 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 and around water skiing enough to get a sense of how video content has been distributed or edited or or, or conceived right um what do you see some of the things we have going for us in terms of video and what are, what are instead some of the pitfalls and things that the 
video in water skiing could improve? Hmm. Well, I don't know if this is the exact answer you're looking for, but the first thing that comes to mind is that, well, first of all, the amount of creativity is, is amazing. I mean, some of the videos you see, some of the shots people get really blow me away. Some of the stuff I've seen, Marcus Brown, there's some, there's some beautiful shots out there. But I would say a pitfall is that they kind of have to be incredibly creative and incredibly beautiful because it's a very intense sport in person. But to just watch it from a camera, it looks very slow and not terribly interesting, I have to admit. Like in person, it's crazy. I mean, it's super stressful. It's very unforgiving. Now, looking at it from the, the tower cam or from a typical drone shot, it's very hard to capture the speed and the intensity. It's not like some other sports where, I mean, an extreme example might be wingsuit flying or something like that, where, you know, you watch and you're like, this is absolutely nuts. And it's so entertaining just from how sheer extreme it is that you don't kind of have to rely on such good cinematography and such creative shots. Yeah, you just chug a GoPro on someone's head and it's already a great shot. Exactly, exactly. But with water skiing, I mean, that's really, that, that's really been what's more tough than anything, is trying to find shots that really capture the intensity. And you always end up in the water. <laughs> like, you always end up the camera, by the water. I mean, between Vince and me, we, we've lost a few cameras just from trying to get shots. I mean, at least a few cameras. Some nice cameras, too. And just because, I mean, first of all, obviously, it's a, it's a water sport. So you're always by water, and cameras are obviously... <laughs> not big fans of water but i mean you've got to be you've got to be so close to try to capture the intensity and it makes it incredibly difficult because i i mean just kind of exactly what i already said just water and cameras do not go together so you have to find ways to either use a gopro which personally i think the gopro is i think gopros look good but I think they're so common that you don't get the wow factor. I think as soon as you can tell it's a GoPro shot, you kind of lose the wow factor just because you know someone just put a GoPro on a stick. So you kind of inherently know it's not as impressive, mm -hmm. which right there makes it really difficult because you need to find a way to put, you know, a $10,000 rig in the water and you need to get some kind of water housing, but then the camera might weigh 10 pounds. And then, you know, that, that one shot we got for a story of a champion where the water, where the camera actually goes through the spray behind the skier. I mean, I don't know if you saw the behind the scenes stuff for that, but yeah, we had like a, a 10 pound, roughly $10,000 rig, 20 feet hanging off the boat, going through the spray of the skier. I mean, it, it, oh, it was nuts. It was absolutely nuts. It was a very, very stressful day, to be honest. We were, we didn't really talk much until it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Just Vincent, I'm assuming, grabbing the steel wheel as hard as he could, making sure that it was at the perfect distance, you know. Uh, but I find what you said interesting. Um, and I wasn't looking for any kind of answer, honestly. I just wanted your opinion as, um, shall I say, a newcomer to the sport with expertise in video, right? Um, and I find it interesting that you said that you see a lot of creativity out there, um, which I, now thinking back, I do also. But what, uh, any cool ideas that water skiing generated for you in terms of like different shots, different angles, or maybe some of the ideas that you've had that you kind of want to try? I mean, you can share whatever you want. I know that we tend to be a little secretive about these things, but anything that, if I could only do that, uh, have you had any of those thoughts recently? Maybe there's a, a few things I wish we could do that we haven't really found out the way. And I, I brought up these FPV style drones earlier. And I, I think maybe that's the answer because I really want to put cameras in really weird places and those types of drones will do it. But in terms of, I mean, I, I guess maybe some of the tricks I found has been trying to find some kind of foreground. Like I typically get, and again, back to the water, I typically get insanely close to the water for almost every shot. Like what I do actually for the for the San Gervasio promo is I had my hand under the camera and held it to where my hand was barely touching the water in the lake so that I could feel if the water came up another half inch, it'd be on the camera. And the, the kinds of cameras we use are actually open on the bottom so they can have like uh, air move through them. So if the water touches the bottom of the camera, I mean, it's done. 
So, I mean, that's pretty much how, how close we get on a normal day, you know, on, on just a, a day at, at San Gervasio. But, I mean, that, that's something I found that you almost have to do is try to find some way to get something in the foreground, whether it's the water that's right an inch from the lens or either you're literally in the lake so close to the skier with a wide angle and the inside the buoy shot or something like that. And, and that's something I found that you kind of have to do. But let me think. Let me think how to phrase this. I think, I don't know, may, maybe one sh one kind of shot I'd really want to see is like, I mean, this might be a bit extreme, but, you know, flying a, a drone under the rope of a skier. <laughs> You know, like, I mean, like, like, just crazy stuff, because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like something like that's the next step. Like, it's almost as cinematic as it could be. You know, we shoot at golden hour, we decent enough cameras, we, we set it up in a more cinematic way. But it's like, what are the the absolute limits of where we can put a camera? Can we put it under the rope? Well, like I mean, fly? you're going to you're going to need some skier that has a high level of control <laughs> of the handle, like no slack line at all. Like they, they better be connected to the board at all times before slack just links shots your drone like miles away. Blue some drones. No question. We're, we're already planning for how many drones that are going to be lost and searching for the next interesting shot. Like it's just I've already been researching how much a drone can be salvaged. Like and, and apparently a lot of the motors are brushed with so the motors actually can survive being underwater so so that's good news yeah, that's the level of thinking these guys are putting in to to promote the sport oh my god this is this is unbelievable <laughs> vino i mean obviously you have you know you have similar expertise to john and you've been in water skiing since before you can remember uh what are you seeing any any comment on that like do you see any angles that could be done better any improvements in that side something that you want to share I mean that's that's been yeah that's been that's been the challenge since the beginning. John's totally right. I mean, the the the, the now but the way to to impress the audience is to to get the shot that the other guy didn't really have, and that's why we also trying to connecting back to webcast. We're trying to bring, uh, let's say, photo shoot type shots into a live event where we went with the water cam. Uh, the I mean. Me personally, before the water cam, I've never seen an inside the bush shot at 41 off at the final of a pro event, you know, and uh, and and that's that's what I love about this camera is that we're really capturing the intensity at an event, which this is even next level. It's not just you're in your own garden with a nice sunset and a flash in the boat and you get an inside the bush shot. Nowadays, everyone, I mean, not every. Maybe not everyone, but we've seen plenty enough of these. Let's let's put it this way. Now, if we manage to get inside the sh inside the the bush shots and in, in, in live webcast and and drone now in live webcast and cameras on the driver and all that, get intense shot in a webcast. I think that's a bit the the the, the new leap. Okay, so like bringing unseen live angles to webcasting. Exactly. Yeah, that that is a good way to put it because that is where the that is where the real um, difficulty is because um, narrative style shooting where you you know you press record and you figure out a way to get the shot. I mean, you have all the time in the world to get it. And and again, that that's the that's the real problem with live is how do you get that video signal to the computer so you can broadcast it? And and that's immensely difficult. And then something like the water cam is amazing. I mean, I mean, there's so much stuff with the water cam. I wasn't uh, very involved. And making it but just when i was seeing how it works and when i was learning like what went into it i was absolutely blown away like the sending video through an ethernet cable for example i didn't even know was something you could really do and it's good video too it's full hd 60 frames a second through the type of cable the only type of cable we can actually run that kind of distance right uh, the the water cam is is a podcast on itself almost it's for me it's the the piece of the two Proudest thing we did in webcast for as of now for me is rope tension and water cam. So yeah, because we didn't even talk about rope tension and live rope tension as you watch on on webcast, <laughs> the skier pulling behind the boat. Uh, any anything that you want to share about maybe some new things coming or people will see them when they come. Uh, I think we can we, we 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 can share a little bit. I mean, by by now, most most of the people, maybe not all of them, but but a few of them are aware that I'm trying to get the live 
speed, uh, g-forces, angle, and heart rate of the skiers while he skis, and 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 we're slowly getting there. It's uh, it's always it's always the the thing is is getting the data, being able to to send the data to shore, and being able to show the data, and being able to find a man that can do all these things for not tens of thousands of dollars. That's uh, that's always the things. Uh, everything's everything's possible but not everything's possible with the, with the budget we have and and that's where a little bit uh, the networking and, and and pushing and asking and and hard work get get gets it done you know and the nice thing that uh, that that we also experience as as we have become more experienced doing the webcast and that that kind of thing is we're actually starting to get correspondence from people that have different skill sets that, that that want to contribute a bit of their time and their expertise to make to make some of what we have on on our dream list uh, come to uh, such, such as uh, such as what Vince has uh, has alluded to with the telemetry and the G forces and all that kind of kind of stuff. And as a segue beyond that, we're trying to develop a more comprehensive graphics package to where uh, to to where the the view the viewer the end viewer will actually see all of all of the all of the telemetry stuff uh, better presented in in a way that looks fresh and, and it looks you know e easily comprehensible. Yeah, no, and and I think that's also like crazy important, right? I think. One of the reasons why a lot of the sports we see on ESPN or in other big television channels are so appealing is also how the amount of statistics they report, how they report the statistics, how smoothly they switch from a replay to a live shot. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of things involved to make this experience, uh, how you say, uh, visually pleasurable, right? Um, yeah. And I, I mean, uh, the amount of work that you guys put in into you know, aspiring to that, you know, both in terms of stats, of shots, of smoothness of the image, uh, to me is unmatched in our sport. I mean, I mean, now it's not, it's not really a, a secret. I mean, me personally, Tony is working a lot on the graphic and, and John a lot of on the promo video. Me personally, I spend most 80% of my time right now working on, on telemetry stuff every time. I mean, I, I try to to push it a lot and and some people might find oh well, why do we need to know the speed of the skier it might sometimes it might sound a bit stupid and it's it's a lot of work for for maybe not not a lot but it's stuff that the audience gets to relate immediately you know when a skier goes and pulls a thousand pound whoever you are you're going to find it impressive you know while three at 41 if you're not in the sport you're not going to relate to it so speed uh tension on the line G forces, all that is 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 stuff that, that the common common people can can understand, which which might be able to help. You know, and as well, carrying on from that, you know, we present information on the screen like our rope bug, you know, which which occupies the top left corner, you know, with the line lengths, you know, not only in meters, but also in feet, because we because we realize that there are folks out there like John Horton who can't translate between metric and feet, you know, so he's he's got to, he's got to be able to uh, uh, to to watch the event and understand what's going on. Well, Tony, chill out, because uh, John not only is a big supporter of the Water Ski Podcast, but he's going to be on soon. I'll, I'll have him rebut that, maybe, if he can. I don't know. Um, all right. Guys, um, I don't know. We've been, we've been going for a while. What did we not say? Maybe, maybe where it goes from here in terms of media and the sport. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good, that's a good okay. point. If, if you don't mind my two cents, I think, and I don't want to speak for Vince and Tony, but I think to some extent we'll agree that it, it's becoming more of making it a show and less of just getting it done. Because for the longest time, we've been just trying to learn how to use this equipment and finding the best equipment and meeting the kind of standards we need to meet. And we're getting near a point where we're getting pretty decent and knowing how to use our equipment, and I hate to say that because who knows what's going to happen at the, the next no, I'm just seeing conference. Vincent's face in the background like, I don't know, dude. Pretty decent is uh, ambitious. <laughs> uh, pretty decent. 
reason is a, a very uh, it is a generous way to put it, but but to be honest with you, it, it's almost like it's almost like the next step in my opinion is making it like a show. It's getting um, multiple interviews. It, you know, it, it's keeping it moving and keeping it entertaining. And I think, for example, what Vince is doing with the telemetry helps a lot because you know when we have more stuff, we get to to look at more things we get to relate to. And then and then of course the announcing and Tony's doing uh, an amazing job. And we can bring in other skiers. Like hopefully we can bring in more skiers more often to maybe even talk about the the passes they just ran if they're up for and stuff like that but just finding a way to to make it as entertaining as possible to where you you feel like you're watching you know any major sport you know yeah. you, you don't feel like it's the bare minimum and it's cool and it's great and we appreciate it but you really feel like wow that this is cool in my opinion that that's kind of the next major major benchmark to and do you think it's i mean i mean assuming you say that also primarily because water skiing has a lot of gaps like a lot of dead time, a lot of, you know, nothing happening in between a skier and the other and, and stuff like that. Is that is that why you deem that necessary or just in general in terms of quality of, of the broadcast? I mean, well, well, both, you know, and, uh, and and you made a good point about about golf and, and they do a lot of things in between to keep that interesting, too, because there's also quite a lot of dead time there. But also at the same time, you know, we're so occupied just keeping cameras going. Like I'm, I'm literally running around the entire time when Vince can't move because he's behind the computer cutting and Tony's announcing and he's, he's helping Vince figure out this problem or that problem. We don't have, you know, 10 seconds to make sure it's, you know, entertaining. And sometimes it'll hang on a, a tower cam shot for 30 seconds. And I, I mean, to be honest, sometimes we're lucky to have that 30 seconds of the tower cam shot. We're thankful it's there. But also it, it, it's like... We could be cutting around. We could be playing maybe pre-recorded things. You know what I mean? And and I, I think we're starting to get to the point where we can actually focus on that a little more as the equipment starts to become more reliable and stuff like that. We can spend more time trying to make it as good as possible for everyone watching rather than just making sure it's live at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of want to hear uh, Vince and Tony's take on this. What, what is the next step? What is the next step? Uh, so far as the next step is concerned, I think uh, I, I think beyond what we do in the live context with our webcasts, uh, it's and, and it, this actually goes back to kind of what John is saying, making it more of a show, trying to package, put, make each of these events packageable, you know, with the interviews, with the performances, package it up, you know, and and make it into something like a 30 minute or an hour long show. You know, you make sure you make sure that you've got like three three minutes of black somewhere you know for for someone to insert their own commercials and that kind of stuff you know and at, and actually and, and actually try to get more or more of the industry or or actually better still even more people outside of the industry to come in and support the sport on that on on that level you know so that we can produce a product a package from each event you know that could sustain a season long run of, of of tournaments on TV type deal. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Vino? Yeah, I mean def definitely agree with what John said. It's it now it's more a question of 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 raising the quality and 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 making it more way more entertaining. Um in water ski what we got going for us is is as John said a very impressive sport. What we don't have always working for us is that it's fairly long. A water ski event is long with a lot of repetition, not a lot of breaks, actually, uh, because you go on for a pass and you get a 45 second pause to go on for next pass and a 45 and we go on to the next pass. So there's a lot of repetition, but not necessarily a lot of breaks, which that's where a little bit the work comes in. It's not just putting a five minutes video together that we're going to play during the break. This, we got commercial, people already do that. It's more entertaining the audience in between passes and also maybe find a pattern to, to, to kind of make the final more interesting than the prelims. I know it's, it, it, it might sound a little blurry with what I said, but that's where a bit the telemetry stuff comes in, more to stuff to talk about bet in between passes. Uh, or we're, we're built an announcer desk, also it looks more professional and all that. So yeah, it's it's about more 
making it a making it a show, making it more professional, and and yeah, now we're at a position definitely where we can focus on making the webcast look better instead of just making sure everything stays live. Yeah. Oh, Tony, still there? Yes, I am most definitely still here. Uh, where, 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 where else would I be? No, no, I thought I thought you wanted to say something. My bad. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, just to go along with what Vince said, you know, I mean, that's the whole deal about the show. You know, he mentioned, you know, with the announcing desk, that's 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 something that we will be introducing in, you know, kind of like the studio setup. You know, you, you know, when you go into like a halftime, you know, at like a, a Serie A or a, or a or a Premier League game and then you cut to a studio where you've got some three has-been footballers, you know, and one guy that does all the announcing, you know, a studio host, you know, that's what we, that's what we are looking to, to implement next, you know, and, you know, again, it's, it's a show and we've got, we've got to try and present it more in that way to encourage more people from outside the sport to actually invest in the sport, you know, to get more bang for their buck. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me, honestly. Um, guys, I mean, I don't know. I think we covered a lot. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think yeah, I think we got we got we got most of it. Yeah. Anything I mean, you, you want to talk about, Tony, that we missed or? Uh, wow, there's there's so many topics, but I don't want to bore people to death. Nah, no, I think we got most of it. I don't think people are gonna be bored from this episode. This was good quality stuff. Um, John, Tony, Vino. Thank you so much. This was, uh, I really, as you guys know, I've been wanting to do this for a while. So very honored that you guys decided to be part of this. And I'm extremely thankful for the work that you do. Um, not just at my event, but for the sport of water skiing. And I know that I speak for a lot of water skiers out there. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having us. And thank you for, for being the first man that gave us the opportunity to, to, to show what we, what we could do. Uh, Dude, pleasure. Glad to have you support us, and we're glad to support you. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Tony, thanks a lot. Not a problem, not a problem. And uh, just to remind those good folks out there that they can uh, watch our complete archive by going to waterskibroadcasting.com. Yeah, and uh, I'll have, uh, sh in the show notes, I'll have a, a ton of links from previous tournaments and uh, uh, your website, your social media and whatnot. So people will be able to find you. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, good. Cheers. Thank you.